So picking up with S3, and I believe Eric Fitzpatrick is going to walk us through. <clears throat> yes, that, that's right, Senator Brew. <clears throat> um, Fire at will. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, if Peggy's there. Uh, I'm going to try and share the document. Uh, and uh, Peggy and I were working on this yesterday, and I hopefully have um, mastered this fine art, but uh, the next few seconds will tell us if this is going to work or not. Uh, I should first uh, just point out that it, introduce myself. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to uh, walk the committee through Senate Bill Number Three. S3 is an act relating to uh, competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. And if that bill looks familiar to everybody, it should. Uh, this is S3 this year, but last year it was S183. You may recall that we, uh, the committee spent quite a bit of time on it last year and it passed your committee, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and it passed the full Senate as well. Um, then uh, as we all remember, the uh, work of the legislature changed substantially when the emergency, emergency was declared as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic on March 13th of 2020. So plenty of the legislation that you had worked on up until that point uh, didn't actually get to the end. And this was one of those bills that uh, uh, you spent a lot of time on, but th there simply wasn't time with it because of the unforeseen nature of the, of the pandemic. So uh, Eric, it's back, sorry, sorry. Remind me of the number from last year again. Yes, last year it was S183, 183. And uh, uh, pa as I said, passed the Senate, uh, but I don't think House there was time to take it up in the House last year, so uh, you're starting again with it, with it this year. Is this, uh, uh, Eric, just to clarify, is this yeah. exactly what we passed? Other than the effective date, yep. Uh, okay. Uh, other than that, it's uh, word for word, as far as I recall. Um, okay, great. Although I should say, interesting that you say, I'll get to this point when we get there, when you say what we passed, it's what the Senate, the full body of the Senate passed. There was actually uh, a change that was made on the Senate floor, which I'll get to uh, when I do the walkthrough, but there was an amendment on the Senate floor uh, to what passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So what, okay. what your committee passed was changed slightly on the floor, uh, but then, um, then passed the Senate, and what you see in front of you is what passed the Senate. Do you remember who made the change on the floor? I'm pre I was thinking about that yesterday as I was reviewing it, and I'm pretty sure... Uh, and when I say I'm pretty sure that's the red flag should go up for everybody that <laughs> maybe I'm not, but I think that it was uh, Senator Pearson and uh, I think Senator um, Sorotkin as well uh, okay. were the two folks who I think um, made the point on the Senate floor and then uh, everyone agreed on a language to address their concern and then it went forward. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Sure. So I'm gonna try and uh, pull up the document now and see if I can um, get it in front of everybody. Um, huh. Interesting looking screen. Yes, that's step. That's a, I think I'm on the way. Hopefully. Um, okay. All right. Uh, uh, was I successful? Yes. Yes. Oh, few. All right. Well, good. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm glad that uh, you have the bill in front of you now, and you can see it on your screens. As I mentioned, this is S3, an act relating to. Uh, competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense, just to sort of, I know that we spent a lot of time on this last year, but uh, it's been a while since he looked at it. So just as a moment or two of uh, uh, background to understand what's going on here, this uh, bill has to do with uh, criminal proceedings that involve the defendant's sanity uh, at the time an offense was committed or the defendant's competency to stand trial uh, for the criminal offense. And of all those two those two concepts are certainly very much related in that they both deal with uh, the mental health status of a defendant uh, in connection 
with a, a criminal proceeding, they're also two different concepts because when you're talking about uh, defendant's uh, sanity, at, you're really talking about their mental health status at the time the offense was committed. Whereas when you're talking about uh, a defendant's competency to stand trial, you're talking about their mental health status uh, at the time of the trial. And those are, those are two different things. So with respect to the insanity defense, uh, what that means is that a person is not guilty by reason of insanity. And again, that's a term of art that's been used for, for a long time. So I'm going to continue to use that term, although obviously it might not be the sort of language that we would use today. But a person is, is not guilty by reason of insanity uh, if, as a result of a mental illness, they either can't understand uh, that their conduct was criminal or they are unable to conform their conduct with the requirements of the law. So at that precise moment that the offense is committed, they either they either cannot understand that their own conduct is criminal, or even if they do understand it, uh, they don't have the ability to, to conform their conduct to, to what the law requires. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you're talking about competency, competency to stand trial, uh, that has to do with the defendant's mental health status at the time of the trial. And uh, the question at that point is, uh, are they, are, and they're inco the uh, defendant would be found incompetent to stand trial if they are either unable to understand the criminal charges or unable to participate meaningfully in their own defense. So either you can't understand what the criminal charges are or you're unable to uh, participate in, in your own defense. And there's a, a huge uh, consequence um, to a difference in consequences, I should say, uh, to being either found uh, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial. As the, as the phrase indicates, if you uh, are insane at the time of the offense, then you are not guilty of the offense. And that is permanent. You cannot be recharged with that offense at all. So being found insane at the time of the offense is a bar, a complete bar to any further prosecution. On the other hand, if you're found incompetent to stand trial, well, uh, that competency can be regained in the future through treatment, for example. A person could be treated and that competency could be regained. And in the future, they could be found competent to stand trial and then they could be charged, recharged with the offense. So you see that's a big distinction, uh, one of the primary distinctions in terms of uh, the legal effect of the two, uh, the two findings. So uh, there is um, uh, quite a bit. The current law is, is very detailed and describes with, with uh, a lot of specificity um, the procedures that are related to the insanity defense and, the, and competency to stand trial, the legal procedures. And uh, that's what S1, what S3 uh, concerns. It makes some amendments to the various legal procedures that are related to the uh, insanity defense and to competency to stand trial. So that's the general background. I'm going to move forward with what, what are the specific proposals in, in S3 uh, regarding changes to, to these proceedings, unless I can. And the thing I'm noticing here is that with the, with the bill on the screen, I can't see anybody raising their hand. So if someone has a question, please feel free to interrupt me as I'm, as I'm moving along. And I'll try to pause between topics so that there's an opportunity for, for people to ask questions. Is, does that seem like an okay way to proceed, Senator Brew? Uh, Senator Sears is back now. Oh, okay, thank you. That's, that's fine, and, and thank you for the patience committee. Um, and uh, go right ahead. Okay, I've actually thanks. got my screen so I can see everybody because I've got a copy of the bill in front of me, so. All right. Want to, I, I can, if somebody raises their hand or something, I might see them, I don't know. Oh, okay, yeah, that'd be great. Please, if, if someone has a question, feel free to jump in and let me know. Yep. All right, thanks. So uh, jumping right into to section one, uh, section one deals with, with the, uh, this uh, psychiatric examination that has to occur uh, when uh, the, uh, the question of the defendant's sanity or competency is raised. So when, when the sanity or competency is, ra is raised, the court has to order that a, a psychiatric examination of the defendant take place. But if you look at the wording of the statute, and I'm looking at line 12 of page uh, two, I believe it is. Yes, line 12, page two. Uh, you see the way uh, 
the wording is phrased requires that uh, the psychiatric examination that I just mentioned has to examine both uh, in subdivision one, the, the mental competency, competency of the person and that's line 12, the struck through word and that's existing law uh, and the sanity of the person. However, you know, as, as I just mentioned and as uh, I just discussed, competency uh, at the time of trial and sanity at the time of the offense are two different things. And it's not unusual for uh, a defendant to raise uh, competency or sanity, but not necessarily a both. So uh, the language isn't really accurate as to what the psychiatric examination should entail. So you see the the proposal is to uh, make clear that these two uh, examinations are different and that uh, the examination could uh, look at the defendant's competency or sanity or both. And you see that new language in line 10. So it's phrased differently to say, the examination has to look at one or both of the following. So it's not gonna be and anymore, it would be you know, it would depend on the particular circumstances of, of the given case, whether or not it's going to be the psych, psychiatric examination would look at competency or sanity or both. So that's the first proposal that you see there. Uh, the language you see at the bottom of that page is just technical in nature to boots and suspenders, really, to make, to make it consistent with the change that I just described so that the language is accurate. Uh, but there is over on page three, a couple of more changes regarding this psychiatric examination. And the first one is on line four, you see, so this psychiatric examination takes place and then there's a report generated. And, and that last sentence uh, at the top of page three uh, indicates who this report has to be uh, sent to. So it's, it's transmitted to the court. You see that in existing law lines one and two. And then the court sends copies to the state's attorney and to the respondent's attorney. That's the person who was examined if the respondent is represented by counsel. And this adds uh, uh, the commissioner of mental health. Obviously the department of mental health is uh, uh, very much involved in proceedings when uh, there's a psychiatric examination of a person uh, involved in a criminal matter. And uh, this just uh, clarifies that when this report is generated by the, after the psychiatric exam that the, that the uh, commissioner in the department gets a copy as well. Can I, can I center up? Why is that the, it's needed to go to the commissioner of mental health. That was something we argued about last year. Oh. <laughs> but go ahead and answer that. I, I, think, uh, uh, I think it was a matter of them being, because these proceedings will often uh, involve the department's personnel and resources and that they would therefore want to know. But I would actually defer to, to the department's witnesses to uh, more more specifics about why that is. I think that was part of a compromise. I, remember. I may be wrong, my memory isn't always that way. But I remember the discussions, perhaps Morning Fox when he tested it. Okay. Remind us of why we did it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this next next subdivision, subdivision two, continuing on with the subject of the report. Remember, I just mentioned there was you may, there's a proposal to make a, a change earlier on so that um, this examination won't necessarily involve both competency and uh, sanity. But this paragraph involves situations in which it does. So let's say that the that the report examines is, is that the uh, psychiatrist or psychologist is asked to provide opinions. Uh, on both competency and sanity. Uh, and this subdivision addresses that situation. You see line seven or eight, first thing it says is, okay, those opinions are gonna be presented in separate reports and addressed separately by the court. So these two separate issues are gonna be uh, addressed in separate reports. And secondly, the second sentence is this idea that if that's the case, that both, both sanity and competency are gonna be examined, then uh, the examination of the, pertins, of the person's sanity only takes place, it's only undertaken if the psychiatrist or psychologist is able to form an opinion that the person is competent to stand trial. If you sort of think about that logistically, it makes some sense because if the, if the initial examination um, finds that the person is incompetent to stand trial, 
then the trial is not going to happen. It's not going to go forward. So there would be no reason at that point in time for there to be an opinion about the person's sanity. You know, it may be that the person will never regain competence and the, the trial will never happen. So that the, the time and resources that would be involved in the sanity examination wouldn't be necessary. On the other hand, if they find that the person is competent and uh, there's going to be a question of the person's sanity at trial raised as well, well, then it would make sense to go ahead with with the examination of the person's sanity at the time of the offense, because the trial is going to proceed and the person is going to be raising that defense. So that's why that I think is is clarified that uh, there's no reason to do do both examinations until the person is found competent. Um, and does that make sense to folks? If so, um, we can move on to the next section. Alice, again, it does make sense, but in terms of a lawyer representing the person who might be insane, maybe they would want to get that done so that the person, the issue wouldn't come up again for the person. That's my only thought. I mean, it doesn't seem to, it's okay this way, but in terms of the person representing the person who they believe was insane at the time, it seems like they, it might be in the, that person charged, um, the lawyer might want them found insane so the case couldn't come up again in later years. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, uh, Senator Nitka, and uh, I think you're going to have some testimony from uh, Jack McCulloch and others who represent those defendants, and, and uh, so it might be that that'd be a good question to ask and see if uh, if this sort of process that's laid out here is is one that makes good sense. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, moving on to section two. So now we're sort of at addressing a, a different stage in the proceedings. So again, so we just talked about how when uh, sanity and competency are raised, a, a psychiatric report has to be conducted. Uh, and the stage the proceedings we're at now is that, well, let's, let's uh, assume that uh, the report finds and, and, there's a, and the court finds as well that the person is either uh, incompetent to stand trial or uh, was insane at the time of the offense. If, if that happens, if the court, uh, if, if one of those two um, findings is made, then the next question that comes up is, well, should the person be committed uh, to the Department of Mental Health for treatment? And that uh, question turns on the issue, which is a language that this committee, I'm sure, is very familiar with, is whether the person is a danger to themselves or others. And if you're found to be a danger to yourself or others, then you would be uh, committed to the Department of Mental Health for treatment after um, after having been found either incompetent or not sane at the at the time of the crime, so the uh, way the current law exists is that uh, the the court has to have this hearing uh, to determine whether or not you are a danger to yourself or others. So that's the uh, uh, formal hearing in court in order to reach that conclusion and decide whether or not you should be uh, uh, committed to the Department of Mental Health. And at that hearing, under current law, uh, the defendant is uh, represented, continues to be represented by their criminal defense counsel. But uh, as I just uh, described, the proceeding at that time is no longer, it's not a criminal proceeding anymore. You're not deciding whether or not uh, the person has committed the crime or not, or the, whether the person is guilty or not. The, the issue at that hearing is, is the person a danger to themselves or others? It's a, it's a, a, a hearing about the mental health status of the defendant. So given that, uh, the proposal here in subsection B is that the person is going to be entitled to have a counsel appointed by legal aid, by Vermont Legal Aid, to represent the person, since this, again, is more of a mental health proceeding at that point than it is a criminal defense one. Uh, and you'll see that language on lines 12 and 13 of page four here, which is where we are. So if the person's found incompetent or, or uh, insane at the time of trial, then starting on line 12, the person shall be entitled to have counsel appointed for Vermont Legal Aid to represent the person. Um, this brings up the floor amendment that I mentioned at the beginning of my testimony. So as the bill, as S-183 last year, as that passed out of Senate Judiciary, uh, on line 12, the language read, uh, the person shall, and it did not contain the words, be entitled to. The person shall have counsel appointed from Vermont Legal Aid to represent the person. Now, you may recall that the discussion, uh, when this 
came out onto the Senate floor last year, there was a discussion of whether, well, what if the person uh, wanted to have their criminal defense counsel continue to represent them? Would the language as written, and as I say, it said at the time, the person shall have counsel appointed for Vermont legal aid, would that language prohibit the person from choosing uh, to continue to be represented by their criminal defense attorney? And so there was some discussion about that. And I think to, to address that concern, we, the, the words uh, be entitled to were inserted. So that way, you know, you provide the person with the option. They can have their criminal defense attorney continue to represent them, or they can have counsel appointed from legal aid. And that was the way uh, the, the amendment was made, and that was the way the bill passed the Senate last year. Um, the second sentence is a, a similar issue that we mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, the, Depart the Department of Mental Health is very much involved in these proceedings, uh, given, uh, you know, that the, in this case in particular, at this stage, I should say in particular, the question is whether the person is going to be committed to the custody of the Department of Mental Health. So this makes clear that the department uh, is entitled to appear and call witnesses and be represented uh, by the Office of the Attorney General at that proceeding. So that's uh, that piece of it. I can move on to the next one now, unless there's questions. All right, so now we're moving on to section three and this section involves victim notification. So what's being addressed here is that, uh, you know, as I, we were just were talking about, the person may be uh, committed to DMH custody if they're find, found to be a danger to themselves or others. So let's say that that does happen. So the, the court concludes that the person is uh, a person in need of treatment, um, potential danger to themselves or others, is committed to the Department of Mental Health custody. While the person is in uh, the department's custody receiving treatment, it's uh, always possible that the person's status will change. You know, they, they uh, may, treatment may, may be successful. The person could be discharged from department custody, the person could be discharged from a secure mental health facility. There could be these changes in the person's treatment status uh, at that time, but there's no mechanism uh, currently in statute for victims to be notified when that happens, for when the person might be discharged from custody completely, or they might be discharged from a secure mental health facility that a victim uh, doesn't find out. You'll see that, I'm just gonna look at existing law for a second here, uh, this is sub, I'm on page five, sub, subsection C1 there, subdivision C1. You'll see there is uh, a uh, provision made for the state's attorney to be notified uh, when a person is discharged. I'm on lines 10 through um, 15. So that's existing law. It says at least, ten, uh, at least 10 days prior to the proposed discharge of any person committed under this section, that means, you know, danger to themselves or others, they were committed. Um, at least 10 days prior to the proposed discharge, the commissioner has to give notice of that discharge to the committing court, the court that committed the person, and the state's attorney of the county where the prosecution originated. So there is, in discharge situations, uh, a provision for notice to the state's attorney. But there's nothing involved, uh, provides notice to uh, the victim of the crime. So that's the proposal here in section two. I'm moving down the uh, page six, so you can see what the proposed language right. is. And the idea here is that for certain offenses, for listed crimes, with some exceptions, uh, there will be notice provided uh, similar to the notice that we just looked at to the state's attorney. I'm going to skip over the crimes for a second and go right down to the process here, just so you can see that. This is page Eric, seven. can I ask a question first? Yeah, please do. Jeanette, um, <clears throat> does this list um, committed here refers both to um, hospitalization and non-hospitalization orders? Yes, I believe that's okay. true. I, I think, uh, I think so. uh, I'll let Katie chime in on that if I'm wrong, but I think that's true. Okay. Yes, committed <coughs> in that context. <coughs> okay, thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so if a person has been committed uh, uh, to DMH custody uh, under these procedures, uh, and then the uh, this is going to change. You look at line five, page seven, at least 10 days prior to that status changing. In this case, at least 10 days prior to discharging the person from a secure mental health uh, treatment facility or discharging the person completely from uh, the care and custody of the department, uh, at least 10 days prior to either one of those things happening, 
uh, the commissioner has to provide notice of the proposed action, whatever that, that change in status is gonna be, to the state's attorney of the county where the prosecution originated or the office of the attorney general that that office prosecuted the case. Then second sentence, state's attorney shall provide notice of that proposed action to any victim of the offense who has not opted out of receiving notice. Remember that was a discussion that happened uh, last year too. Uh, the question was whether, you know, that should notice be automatic or should there be an opt out provision? And the conclusion that the committee reached was that, um, you know, the default is going to be that the victim gets notice, but they can choose to opt out um, if they'd rather not get it. Uh, Brian, uh, Brian, I'm sorry, Eric. Yeah. Um, that raises a question. What can the state's attorney do with the information about this person? Um, since it's HIPAA protected, can the state's attorney go to the press with the information, say so-and-so is being discharged without a bulletin like they would if an untreated sex offender was released from prison? Um, that's it. That's a good question. I, I wouldn't say that I know the answer to that off the top of my head. I, I would tend to think that because it's HIPAA protected that there's some limitations on that. Um, but I'm not sure. So I can look into that a little bit further and it might be something that other witnesses would have an answer to as well. But it's, it's a good question that I'd wanna, I'd wanna research a little bit further. Well, it is, I think it's, it's, I'd like to understand what the limitations are currently on the state's attorney and what they would be if this bill were to become law. Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks. Also, um, Eric, on that same section there, the last sentence, maybe I missed something, but why doesn't that also include the office of the attorney general or the shall provide notice? Um, yeah, I was thinking of that too. That's a good point. I was wondering if uh, um, for, for consistency with the previous sentence, that ought to be, that ought to be included. Yes. Um, so just the last last uh, bit about this, uh, the uh, you'll see that the list of crimes. Now this this process that I just described doesn't apply uh, to all crimes or, or you know a person who has been committed regardless of what the what the crime was. Uh, it only applies to listed crimes uh, and with I think it's seven exceptions or six exceptions. Sorry, um, and that list is is uh, tracks the same list. Uh, you remember last year, this discussion of, well, should it be for every crime? Should it only be uh, uh, certain ones that tend to be on the dangerous side? How do we, how do we uh, make that distinction? And this is just verbatim, the same list that's included in uh, the statute that you passed a, a few years ago regarding uh, felons in possession uh, of uh, firearms. Remember, there's a that similarly said that uh, it was unlawful for a person to be possess a firearm if they were, had been convicted of certain crimes, and it had the same list. It said a listed crime with these exceptions because the committee had gone through the entire list of listed crimes to say, well, are there some that uh, are probably not as um, uh, not involve violence or as serious as the others, and should they be exempted? And since he had already gone through that list and uh, separated out the ones that didn't qualify once, it, the decision was made last year to use the same, the same list with the same distinction. So that's where that comes from. Um, so now we're moving on to section four here. Um, this has to do with, uh, remember the, we're talking about earlier psychiatric examinations when a person's sanity or competency is at issue uh, in a criminal proceeding. And under existing law, I'm gonna look at page eight first and look at the existing law first, uh, which is uh, lines two to five, or really, really uh, lines three to five actually. So under existing law, if you'll see uh, starting in line three in the middle there, if notice is given by the defendant that sanity is an issue, or that expert testimony will be offered as provided in 12.1, that's related to sanity, then the defendant has to submit to a reasonable mental examination by a psychiatrist or other expert. So what this does uh, is that when the defendant provides notice that sanity is an issue in a case, 
uh, then the prosecution is permitted to have its own psychiatrist or other expert conduct what's called a reasonable mental examination of the defendant. However, uh, the rule doesn't uh, address the issue. Remember, we talked about how competency to stand trial is different uh, than sanity at the time of the offense. And this rule doesn't address the competency issue. So uh, it doesn't permit the prosecution to conduct its own examination when the issue is competency uh, rather than sanity. And, and that uh, uh, conclusion was uh, reaffirmed by a Vermont Supreme Court decision called uh, State v. Shero, which held that uh, as a matter of interpreting statutory interpretation, um, there was no ability of the state to have this psychiatric examination in a competency case like there was in a sanity case because the, essentially the statute did not provide for it. Um, so what this does is it adds, you'll see the new language in subdivision J uh, does exactly that. It does add um, the uh, circumstance of the competency uh, to the ability of the prosecution to get this reasonable mental examination by a psychiatrist uh, when there's a competency finding by the court that the defendant is not incompetent to stand trial. So it kind of makes that consistent with the sanity situation in which the prosecution can get its own examination. I should mention here, just so that the committee is aware, that uh, that case that I described, State v. Shero, although it was uh, it did turn on an interpretation of the statute, there's also some discussion of constitutional issues there, and there's certainly an implication that it's possible that there might be a constitutional argument against this as well. And I think, as you know, the committee may remember from last year, uh, I think the the uh, attorney general's office and the defender general's office had different points of view on on uh, whether or not there was a constitutional issue, issue with this language. I think it's one of those situations where reasonable minds can certainly differ, uh, but I just wanted to point that out to the committee so that um, it wouldn't be a surprise if, if uh, when a case uh, is brought to challenge this, uh, that certainly could happen and um, ultimately a decision that the court's gonna have to make, but I uh, want to at least note that. Eric? Yeah. Can can you remind me what the constitutional issue would have been? I think it was in connection with with uh, the defendant's due process rights uh, to uh, not necessarily have uh, be subject to these multiple um, multiple examinations uh, arising out of the same case. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so I've actually gotten to the end of uh, my sections here, and I think uh, uh, I'll ask, I heard Katie on, I, I could certainly do the other sections, but Katie, are you here? And are you planning to do the next couple or? I'm still here. Um, sure, I can jump in. Yeah. Um, can, are you able to keep your document up so we can? Yeah, I was thinking I could page through it as perfect. just tell me, tell me where you want me to go. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the next two sections, first we have a report back to the General Assembly, and then the following section after that um, is the creation of a task force. So first looking at this section five, um, we have a jointly submitted report coming from the Department of Corrections and Mental Health by November 1st of this coming year. And the report is both an inventory and evaluation of mental health services that are provided by the entity that the Department of Corrections contracts with for healthcare services. And if you look down, um, let's see, beginning on line 17, it lists specifically what's going to be in this evaluation, a comparison as to how the type, frequency, and timeliness of mental health services provided in a correctional setting differ from those available in the community. The second part of the evaluation is to address how the MOU that was executed by the Department of Corrections and the Department of Mental Health impact the services that are provided by the entity with whom DOC contracts for healthcare services. So that's the first section. The next section, section six, is the creation of a working group. And that would be created by August 1st of this year by DMH. And it's there. 
paragraph A lists um, a whole, a, quite a lengthy group of stakeholders. And as you'll notice on line six, the language is including as appropriate. So including doesn't um, limit the fact that there might be additional stakeholders that could be part of this working group that are identified by this piece of legislation. Um, so listed stakeholders include the Department of Corrections, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Office of the Attorney General, the Office of the Defender General, Director of Healthcare Reform, Department of Buildings and General Services, a representative appointed by Vermont Care Partners. A rep Oops, could you, sorry, Eric, could you go back up? Oh, sorry. Nope, that's oh, okay. Yep, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. The Mental Healthcare Ombudsman, um, VOS, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Healthcare, a person with a lived experience of mental uh, illness and any other interested party that's permitted by the commissioner. And then we have the um, requirements for what this task force is going to be looking at. So first, the task force is going to be identifying gaps in the current mental health and criminal justice system structure, opportunities to improve public safety and the coordination of treatment for individuals incompetent to stand trial or who are adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. Goes on to say that the work group is to review competency restoration models used in other states and explore models used in other states that balance treatment and public safety risks posed by individuals found, found not guilty by reason of insanity. And it specifically highlights um, psychiatric security review boards, including um, the Connecticut model and guilty but mentally ill verdicts in criminal cases. So those are models that the task force is specifically asked to look at. The second part of um, the tasks that are listed for this task force are looking at facilities. So if you remember when we looked at the group of members, one of the uh, people stakeholders highlighted was um, somebody from BGS. Um, so now uh, maybe the person from BGS wouldn't weigh in so much on subdivision one when we're looking at policy, but in terms of facility, um, that is somebody who would be appropriate, which is why we have language in um, subsection A when we're looking at the membership that the members are to participate as appropriate. So in terms of the second requirement for the task force to look at, um, they're to evaluate various models for the establishment of a state funded forensic treatment facility for individuals found incompetent to stand trial or who are adjudicated not guilty by reason of uh, insanity. Specifically, the evaluation would address the need for a forensic treatment facility the entity or entities most appropriate to operate such a facility, the feasibility and appropriateness of repurposing an existing facility for the purpose of establishing a forensic treatment facility versus the construction of something new. In subdivision D, the number of beds needed in a forensic treatment facility and the impact that repurposing an existing mental health treatment facility would have on the availability of beds for persons seeking uh, treatment in the community or through civil commitment. And lastly, the fiscal impact of constructing or repurposing a forensic treatment facility and the estimated annual operation of costs, um, considering the IMD, Institution of Mental Disease Waivers that are available through CMS. This report um, coming from the task force would be required to be submitted by November 1st of this coming year um, with findings and recommendations to uh, joint justice oversight. And the report is to include proposed draft legislation if um, legislation is identified uh, as necessary by the task force. Then lastly, we have the effective date, uh, July 1, 2021. Thank you. Any questions for Katie or Eric? I have one request, um, and I think it would be for everybody on the committee. Peggy or Eric or Katie, is there any way to retrieve the information that we had from last year's bill? And I'm going to ask for the same thing on the expungement bill. Many of us have files locked away up in the Senate Judiciary Committee room. Um, that we don't have access to, but I don't know how much of it's electronic. Um, it would be helpful, I think, 
particularly for the reporter of the bill and for other members of the committee to have those files. Is there any way to retrieve them? Do you mean, Senator Sears, your own personal files? I mean, all the yes. document, all the documents that you looked at last year, you can yeah. find on the committee page from last year. And I can um, show you the have to go to the 2019 I, session. I, yeah, you just you just had to change the session, and then you can look up the bill, and you can find all the documents that you looked at. But those are only the mm -hmm. documents. Those don't include our notes. I think. What I would like is, and especially if I'm going to report this, and I don't know if I am or not, but if I am, I well, want my file. Well, if it passes, I think you'd be ideal. <laughs> but I, I want my file because my whole report from last year is in there, yep. plus all my notes. And I, I would love to, I don't know if we could have um, Mike Ferrant. Tony to do the, it. Huh? I can have Tony do it. Okay. Go to, oh. go to the drawers and pull out our files. Yeah, I can have it to us. Yep, yeah, I can both ask of those, to do it. Both, both this bill and S7, um, and there's one other that were reintroduced. Yep. I think of which so one it is. S7, S3, and what's the other one? Oh, well, actually, I have to find the old. Um, I'll talk to the attorneys to get the old numbers. What's yeah, the other the, bill? What's the other bill, Eric? I think it's the, the ERPO one. Um, yeah, that would be minor. Okay. But I can get you those. I can get you those, Peggy. The numbers? Yeah. Okay. And then I can ask Tony. I can call him on the phone and tell him where the files are. Okay. That would be great. I think that yeah. would be extremely yeah. helpful to us. Um, I think, and I'm my recollection, I don't remember who reported the expungement bill last year. It might have been me, but it would be helpful to have that. Yep. Okay. S S five is the other one, Peggy. S five this year. Th this year, right? Okay. But I'll get you the number for last year. Okay, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Um, and the other thing that you guys can do, if you want at any point, go. You know, if you want more than just these bills, you could go to the state house, get a box, and take what you want. I mean, I know that's not ideal, but you know, I, I just something to think about for you guys. No, I I probably won't be at the state house until at least March. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll tell you that um, because of the, our living situation up there, we're trading off weeks to go up. So if anybody wants files on a week when I go up there, I will go I, in and I'd like my sport coat back. Okay, should I get it mailed? <laughs> <laughs> no, if you just bring it down, I'll, I'll meet you somewhere. <laughs> I, I kept searching for my sport coat and I realized it's in the judiciary committee room. <laughs> <laughs> but I would do that. I'll do that if anybody wants something from the state that, house. That, thank you. On the weeks. I'll let you know when I go. Okay, good. All right. Um, other questions, comments? Um, Katie and Eric, thank you very much. Our next witness is. Sure. And I'm going to, we're not going to get to all the witnesses this morning. And we're going to pick up with this bill next week, along with the earlier bill. And I didn't get to apologize to everybody um, for not hearing from Pepper, Marshall, uh, and maybe Erica next week on S7. And then next week, whomever we don't get to today, we'll hopefully hear from next week. And I apologize that um, about that. but. Um, Zooming is so much fun um, for all of us to try to get through. Uh, Morning Fox is the next witness. We've got about 20 minutes. I would suspect it'll be the last witness, um, unless he's extremely brief. And then following Morning Fox, it, um, oh, I, okay. I guess that's it. I thought you had somebody else from DMH there, but it, is Karen, Karen Barber's here too. So if you want both to go together, that's fine too. No, I uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. And uh, yes, uh, our general counsel, Karen Barber, is, is with me and we'll kind of tag team through this as, as needed. Um, uh, also, just to help with expediency and such. Uh, so I did want to just uh, start with. Uh, kind of connecting with uh, some of Eric's comments earlier 
uh, and uh, uh, the fact that this is a, a bill that's a, uh, uh, a rev revived bill from, from last year from S-183. Uh, as you all remember, we uh, did have a lot of testimony over that. And one of the things that's outside of this bill that I just want this committee to uh, be aware of is that the Department of Mental Health is uh, very committed to strengthening uh, the forensic system of care uh, within Vermont. Um, and to that end, one of the goals that we're working on uh, outside of legislation is uh, more direct oversight over the forensic evaluators and contracting with a uh, broader group of forensic evaluators as well. Uh, and we're in the process of contracting with some forensic evaluators that are actually uh, contract uh, with numerous states around the country um, and bringing them in um, and some of their comments during our, our contract negotiations um, I will probably bring into some of my testimony as uh, it, it will shed some light on uh, some of the issues that we're bringing up today. Um, one of the earlier questions uh, that were brought up was the need for the Department of Mental Health in receiving the the reports from the evaluators and uh, what that purpose was for. Uh, primarily, uh, we have a couple of things. One, as as you see later in the in the bill, uh, having the Department of Mental Health be able to uh, be a part of these hearings going forward once uh, competency or sanity uh, has has been determined, and that we're going to uh, a hospitalization hearing, if you will. Uh, um, where a person is uh, likely or potentially being placed under the care and custody of the commissioner. And so having these reports uh, help us to prepare for hospitalization hearings and being able to understand what uh, the uh, mental health needs of an individual may or may not be. So we're better able to speak to those needs uh, at that type of a hearing. Um, so I just wanted to try to ad address that. Uh, Going to uh, section one and the separating of, of the reports, uh, as uh, Eric mentioned, you have both competency and sanity. Um, and it's not just, it, it, there's, a, there's several reasons why uh, to, to separate these reports. And I'll just kind of focus on one major one, which is that um, it, it really is a national uh, best practice standard uh, that these uh, evaluations are separated when you're evaluating someone for competency and also their sanity, uh, if a person is, if an evaluator's opinion is that the person is not competent, uh, then it is hard to uh, really imagine, and this is uh, feedback we also receive from professionals, including what this, this uh, organization that we're looking at uh, contracting with that does forensic evaluations throughout the country, is that if a person is not competent, then it does not really make clinical sense to be evaluating their sanity and their ability to participate in an evaluation around their sanity at the time of the alleged event. Uh, and so that is the primary reason for being able to separate uh, these issues. Um, yeah, I, I do appreciate the, uh, the defense attorney's desire uh, maybe to have that sanity piece to be able to use that as a defense. But as long as the person is, is found incompetent, they're not able to move forward with that defense in, in any way, shape or form because the person is not found competent to stand trial. And so there's gonna be no further testimony uh, and, and moving forward in that case until that defendant is found competent. And so separating these reports, once a, a person has been found competent, then they can they can fully participate in that evaluation with the evaluator with the forensic evaluator uh, to determine their sanity at the time of the alleged offense. Moving on to uh, section two, uh, we're also in support of the language here uh, that would provide the provision for legal aid to represent uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the individual uh, who's being charged with alleged alleged offenses. Um, and we're also in support of the Department of Mental Health being entitled to appear and call witnesses at the proceeding. Uh, previous to that, we ha are, have zero ability to be represented uh, in these hearings where the decision is being determined as to 
not only the dangerousness, as uh, Eric Fitzpatrick was mentioning, but also the, the, the main crux of, of these hearings is what is the best location for the treatment of this individual? Uh, if they've now been found incompetent to stand trial or been adjudicated as not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, where, where should their treatment uh, uh, occur? Within a hospital or in a community, uh, things of that sort. And so, and these people will be under the care and custody of the commissioner of mental health. And so to be able to uh, have our ability to appear and call witnesses at those hearings uh, is, is extremely important for us. Going down uh, then into section three, the victim notifications. Uh, the, uh, we are de uh, also as testified last year uh, in support of the 10 day notice to the state's attorneys uh, so that uh, they can provide uh, notification to the victims. Uh, and that 10-day notice is that uh, if the department is uh, planning to discharge an individual uh, who was committed uh, under, under this section for uh, these listed uh, crimes, that uh, if we're looking to discharge them from either a secure facility, and that would include uh, a, a secure hospital or a secure residential facility, locked facility, um, as well as uh, just being discharged uh, completely from the care and custody of the commissioner to notify the state's attorney uh, or uh, attorney general if they prosecuted the case uh, uh, for victim notification. Earlier in the conversation, the question came up around HIPAA uh, and what information the state's attorneys, what they can do with that information. Um, it's our it's our feeling that you know, a uh, state's attorneys are not bound. Uh, they're not a uh, as 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 someone like myself as a mental health practitioner bound by HIPAA. Uh, uh, so it's protected health information. Uh, but a state's attorney or uh, you know, you Senator Sears or something of that sort are not bound by those those constraints. Uh, not being a, a healthcare provider, uh, if you will. Uh, however, we feel that. The language it would be it, to be tweaked that the intent of our ability to give this information to the state attorney that we intend to discharge someone is for victim notification, uh, and so I think our position would be is that it, somehow to be able to tweak that language or somehow clarify that the intent behind this uh, notification to the state's attorney or attorney generals, depending on who prosecuted the case is that the intent for them receiving that information is so that victims uh, uh, can be notified. That's how this came yeah, into this, into this, uh, uh, into this uh, piece of legislation was out of concern from uh, state's attorneys, victim advocates, uh, and others that uh, when people are committed to the care and custody of, of uh, the commissioner and uh, time has gone by, that I've heard state's attorneys describe it as it's a black hole and we just don't know when someone is discharged and victims are unaware, uh, et cetera. And so uh, we agree, you know, it, it, we think that uh, in these kind of circumstances, being able to have victim notification it, is a good thing, uh, that they should have that right and, and have that understanding because we are protected. Uh, yes, sir. Just so I can be specific about my interest in this question. Um, in the juvenile system, the victims have certain rights to know about the victim, ab about the perpetrator, but they are not allowed to provide that information to anyone else. So it, it's against the law for them. It's a, a violation of the law for them to go and talk to a reporter about how frustrated they are that Johnny Jones, you know, He's in a group home and not locked away at the Sununu Center. I, uh, that's the genesis of my question about what can that victim or the public do with that information? I mean, I'll let uh, Karen speak to that a little bit as well, but it might be my understanding that at least as it's currently written, um, I guess my concern would be is that state's attorneys or the, the victim could do anything with that information. Uh, and so 
Uh, is that a good know, case? If there were... I, I just, that's, the, I think, a question that um, we need to resolve at some point. I would say that from from the department's perspective, no, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, you know, as we're talking about someone whose uh, mental illness had an influence into uh, their behaviors. Uh, if they've been adjudicated as not guilty by reason of insanity, they were never convicted of of a crime. Uh, and uh, I think, as this committee and others know, there's uh, a lot of stigma and bias already uh, within our culture towards uh, individuals with uh, mental illnesses. And I would be concerned that uh, just kind of having a free for all with that information uh, could become uh, dangerous for the person that, that we're possibly discharging. Yeah, I, I, I'm just. Um, and for record, Karen Barber, General Counsel for the Department of Mental Health. Um, I note a couple of things. One is that this is really limited to the fact that someone is being either discharged from a secure facility or discharged from our custody. It is not providing information about where that person is going. Um, so it's really limited. Um, you know, kind of going back to the question about what they can do. So HIPAA applies to covered entities, and I'm sure Eric can go more into depth about who's a covered entity and what does that mean under federal law. But HS as a whole is a covered entity, which is why HIPAA applies to DMH and more healthcare provider. Um, it wouldn't apply to the state's attorneys. That doesn't necessarily mean that there may not be some other limitations I, that I may not be familiar with. Um, but I think, you know, as, as Fox said, I think we would have concerns with, you know, some of these folks remember, they could have just been found not competent to stand trial. So they were not necessarily adjudicated and found guilty of a crime. So I think we just need to be really careful about um, what kind of information may or not, may not get out about folks that um, clearly have, um, you know, very challenging mental health issues that uh, they were they were receiving treatment for, um, and so the Department of Mental Health is, you know, of course, with concern with you know protecting folks while also acknowledging that you know victims have a right to understand if someone may not be um, any longer in a secure setting. Well, that's part of the impetus of the bill was to provide some victim notification to the fact that somebody was discharged and or is being discharged. But I thank you. I, I interrupted your testimony. That's okay. Uh, and just so continuing on to section four, uh, I will just briefly, because I have a feeling we'll probably be talking about this more, uh, that uh, um, the the evaluation by psychiatrist uh, uh, or other expert when court order examiner uh, uh, reports that defendant is not competent to stand trial. We're in support of that. Um, I remember the testimony fairly well from, from last year uh, and remember uh, uh, Defender General Matt Valerio bringing up the, the potential constitutionality uh, issues with that and, uh, and that how that may or may not play out uh, going forward. But I think it's an important piece uh, to really uh, make sure that uh, all all parties have uh, the best available information possible to make to make an uninformed decision um, going forward. So, um, Section Five, uh, the assessment with corrections, um, Department of Mental Health. We already work very closely with Department of Corrections, uh, as it mentions in here. We have an MOU and. So being able to discuss uh, uh, and evaluate how that's how that is operated and, and functioned, uh, as well as looking at the the uh, mental health uh, treatment system, if you will, within Department of Corrections. Uh, more than happy to uh, continue engagement with Department of Corrections to uh, further evaluate uh, their system, what the gaps are, and how those could be uh, mitigated. Uh, and then finally, in section six, <clears throat> the we go to care working group. Six, uh, box. Yes. I wonder if the Department of Dale should be involved in this study as well. There are a lot of people who, um, yeah, that are in correctional facilities who um, are borderline at the very least. Um, 
I think that's a really good point, Senator. Um, and I know Katie had to go to another meeting, but Eric, if you could suggest that maybe they sh that Dale should also be involved in this uh, assessment. Yes, absolutely, we'll do. Go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, you're you're exactly right, Senator. Uh, in that you know there are folks with either developmental or traumatic brain injuries or other other things that are within corrections, and so uh, I can understand that that uh, that logic. Um, going into the forensic care working group, um, I I have testified numerous times um, uh, throughout the years around. Uh, the development of a forensic system of care within our state and the lack and the actual the reality that we do not have a forensic system of care in our in our state uh, and so i look forward to being able to uh, participate uh, in in this working group to identify gaps uh, in the system um, i think it's incredibly important uh, for us to look at competency restoration programs. Um, again, I'll come back to uh, the organization that we are in the process of contracting with that does uh, forensic evaluations uh, with numerous states throughout the country. Uh, as part of our discussions with them uh, came up uh, that uh, asked about competency restoration and how that occurs here in our state. We informed them that we don't have a competency restoration program and that they were quite taken back by that. Um, and, you know, these are folks who work in numerous states. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to be able to balance the, the treatment needs of individuals as well as the needs of public safety. Uh, and so I think we need to not only, you know, look at competency or restoration, but we need to look at um, – how we balance those, those safety pieces. And so looking at how other states do competency restoration, looking at things like guilty but mentally ill or, uh, and how that operates, or looking at things like psychiatric security review boards uh, that uh, a, a handful of states or at least two states uh, uh, have, have developed, and looking at those things to see what will work here in Vermont. Uh, I think that's an, an important piece. Uh, and uh, you know, so I think that's that's a uh, uh, an important thing. And then going into looking at facilities and forensic facilities, uh, again, that is something I've I've testified on as far as our need for. Uh, and there are numerous models throughout the country, uh, and Vermont is a significant outlier in that we do not have uh, a a forensic facility. Uh, we do not have a designated place for. Uh, people who uh, have gone through the criminal justice system and are in need of a secure facility. Uh, we currently are using our uh, hospitals uh, that, you know, general hospitals or the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital uh, for those purposes. And on every day, we run the risk of losing our, our federal funding for the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital or things of that sort, because the, the federal funding mandates us that individuals who are in those hospitals have to be receiving active treatment and cannot be held there solely for the purpose of public safety. And so when we start talking about uh, people who have committed uh, significant crimes and we're trying to balance treatment needs and public safety, we struggle with the public safety part right now. Uh, and I think people are aware of different situations that have hap occurred over uh, the last several years where public safety concerns were raised uh, as a result of discharges and such like that. Um, but it's, it's something that we cannot avoid without looking at how this really functions and what type of facilities we have. Many states uh, have, uh, almost every state has a, uh, a forensic facility. The difference is how they're operated. Some are functions under the Department of Mental Health. Some are functions under the Department of Corrections. Some are, are jointly operated. And I think it's important for us to look at those different models uh, and come back to uh, the legislature with a report to, to express, here's what we think would work best for the state. I agree. And I think there's a lot of, and this takes in Senator Benning's committee on institute, as well as, as the state is, you know, looking for replacements for 
Woodside's gone, but um, what happens there? Um, there should be some consideration to that use, but also um, as it looks for a new women's prison, should there also be, um, you know, construction of some kind of a forensic facilities? Um, sure. I'm not trying to mix the two together. Okay. Make that no, clear to anybody who's listening. Um, yeah, Senator White. So, um, in speaking about the forensics population, one of the things that I have always understood is that we have not very many on any given day, people in that category. And it always astounds me that we are completely unwilling, I believe, to look at um, New Hampshire because what my understanding is that they have a, um, at one time anyway, I had thought when I was on institutions and was dealing with the um, mental health um, facilities that New Hampshire had a, a pretty good program. And it always astounds me that we think of that New Hampshire is so far away that we can't put people out of state, but actually New Hampshire is closer to me than Montpelier is. So I, I just urge us to not look only at what we might have in state, but how we might collaborate with, with other people. Nope, that's fair. I appreciate that. And Fox, if I may, the only other thing I would add is that um, on the issue of competency and sanity and dividing those reports and why it's clinically appropriate, you did hear some testimony last year from Dr. Robin, who um, is a, a board certified forensic psychiatrist um, on the faculty at Yale and is now the president of the Vermont Medical Society. So if there are more questions about kind of that clinical, why that makes sense, I'm sure she'd be happy to come back. I think we're gonna schedule the, um, some point I'm sure. Let me send this out to the, and I did meet um, over Zoom with the hospital association and I know they're very interested in this bill. Um, and so others who are interested testifying on this bill, and I should have said this about the expungement bill, please contact Peggy to be on the agenda. We don't want to not hear from folks um, just because we're Zooming. So please feel free to contact us to put on the agenda. But, uh, and uh, I think there were others who also were interested and had worked on this, uh, particularly the forensic working group. Um, last year. Um, all right. Are there other things? I know uh, many of us are having to go to a Zoom. It's wonderful. We go down the hallway and open the next Zoom invitation. Um, I, I won't be there, but um, I'm sure uh, many of you will. And uh, so thank you. For